Hello, good evening. Welcome to this month's webinar on PBSA, or Purpose Built Student Accommodation. Uh, with myself, Mike Holliday, I'm the Investment Manager of Residential Estates. Alongside me, we have Mike Johns. Hi. With us. Um, joining us remotely, we have Andrew Brassi. Uh, good evening, Andrew. You okay? I'm good, thanks, Mike. Two mics. I'm all well, thank you. Ready to go. Good stuff. And then we have, joining us remotely as well, we have Shane from CapEx, which he may not be live on with us, but he will be uh, shortly. He'll be talking about stamp duty uh, with student property, which I know is a popular topic that we'll get some answers to uh, later this evening. So what do we plan to discuss this evening? So we'll talk you through exactly what is PBSA. We appreciate to some people it's very new, so we'll strip it back. Um, talk through the pros and the cons of buying purpose student accommodation. We'll touch on, dare I say, it, COVID and the effects that's had on that particular investment sector. We're going to go on to talk about the pros and cons of uh, buying purpose-built student accommodation. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, stamp duty with Shane. Shane's going to take over and uh, and give us some uh, uh, a definite answer on stamp duty, which is going to be hopefully yeah. once and for we, all. We've struggled to get a straight answer, haven't we, on stamp duty over the last couple of years. So we'll get that answer today, uh, this evening, with Shane um, on that. And then myself, I'll talk about the exit strategy, which is one of the major questions in the early stages of a client looking to, to invest in uh, PBSA. So we'll talk about the exit strategy. Uh, I think Mike is going to talk about where to buy, top tips on uh, where you should be buying PBSA. And then I'll touch on to the villas, a development we have in Stoke-on-Trent. So a little bit of housekeeping for those of you that it's uh, new to. Um, we like to keep them as interactive as possible, don't we, these webinars? So. Mm. Please feel free to shout up any questions that you've got or something you don't agree with what we've said or agree with. Feel free to, to comment on that. On the right hand side of your screen, you'll see the section where it says uh, chat. So just click on that um, and uh, yeah, put any messages you want. Say hi, we'd love to hear from you. And we've got people right across the world that will be joining us uh, this evening. So we really appreciate it. Got it. Uh, we'll also have links to send you during the webinar. I think we'll be able to send you the slides after it as well, should you want to. Watch it again if it's good. Um, but yeah, other than that, yeah, keep it interactive and keep uh, talking with us this evening. Yeah, I think the thing that makes it interactive is the, the thing that makes it a <laughs> webinar is that interaction. Okay. So uh, yeah, please uh, please ask questions. Absolutely. So let's get started. So student accommodation in general, before we focus particularly on PBSA, well, there's sort of three main types in the Johnsy mm -hmm. with this. Um, you have your traditional terrace houses or HMOs which is what I stayed in when I was at university. So for me, there was eight of us in a um, in a house uh, with one shared kitchen and bathroom on it, uh, between us. Uh, they still got now, the HMOs. You also have the halls of residences owned by the universities themselves on their campuses. That's still going. And then this final sector, which we'll discuss in more detail this evening, which is PBSA and purpose-built student accommodation. So they're kind of the three different areas, aren't there, of, uh, of student accommodation on it? Johnsy, where were you when you were here? I started off lodging in a family um, and then really didn't like it. Uh, moved out into halls of residence because a, 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 a place came up. And then in this, uh, my second and third year, I was uh, above a curry house in a, in a, in a HMO. <laughs> Handy, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never think you're looking at me now, but yeah, it was a curry I'm, house, yeah. I'm not saying anything. Uh, Andrew, yourself, were you? I, I followed probably uh, Johnsy's line there. The first year was, uh, I, I went to London, down to uh, North East London. So I stayed initially with a family. Um, one of the other guys on the, on the course with me, he was in the spare bedroom, I was in the main bedroom. And then year three, into an HMO. Um, it was a bit grim, I have to say, it was a bit grim. <laughs> but very good mine, that was 1981. Um, so, you know, student accommodations come a long way since then. Maybe HMO haven't, but PBSA has. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm hoping these aren't images from your property back then, Andrew. <laughs> ah, the, 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 the middle one there looks quite reminiscent, Mike, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the reason why we put this on there, I mean, like Andrew says, I mean, HMOs in particular, where you haven't got an on site management company, they can become very untidy yeah. if students don't look after the place. Um, they're not monitored, you know, and, and no. you, you've got no one to sort of answer to. Everybody looks to each other to do the jobs, you know. Well, people that's used to the parents looking after them, <laughs> yeah. place out there and suddenly they got to look after themselves. So that's an example of pictures of HMOs. 
also halls of residence there's a couple of pictures there that in particular is keel university which i mean we the three of us have been around there haven't we they're mm. not the best looking which i you kind of expect there would be you know if the university owns the accommodation you expect it to be the, the best choice but yeah. often isn't the case and we spoke to a lot of students especially in keel that much prefer living outside of the campus don't they because of the standard of the keel hall itself hopefully yeah. no one's watching from keel halls that uh, lecturers there but um, so yeah that gives you an idea of, uh, of some of the different types of it as well more recently actually we've we've heard that there's 2000 about 2500 um halls of residence in, on keel <coughs> university campus and uh i think around 600 700 of them are considered um <coughs> you know worn down now and it when we opened orm house just down the road recent well a couple of years <coughs> ago um, uh, as a purpose-built student accommodation, people and students were actually just walking in through the front door, asking if they can move into the into warm house. And that was even people who had signed up, wasn't it? Mm. Who would signed up for the year already with the halls, and then yeah. want to get out of the contract and go with PBSS. And, just uh, on another thing with student accommodation, we were just speaking to Mike earlier. Whatever you, if you went to university in the eighties or nineties, or even the early noughties, Whatever you think you know about student accommodation now, you know, uh, you, you need to forget and relearn it because it is a totally different market. It's something that I struggled with because I always thought, yeah, everybody wants to leave and, and go into HMOs and everybody wants to be in HMOs. Things have changed a lot recently and COVID uh, that we're going to come on to in a bit has changed that even more now with, with people's habits and people's, you know, preferences. So just bear that in mind. It's that we always revert to what we know ourselves and we think we know, uh, but that's not always the case, and particularly with student accommodation now. So, Andrew, what is PBSA? Well, I think it's, Mike, it's, it's probably what it says, it's purpose-built student accommodation. Um, and I think if we look, at student accommodation, we, we, we touched on it there with the halls of residence. So the, the principle is nothing new. Halls of residence have been with universities for a good number, well, decades, decades. And, and I think that's why some of it now is quite tired, quite dated. So we, we've got, I think, two elements there. We've got student accommodation that's been around a while in halls of residence and owned by Corporate, co corporate groups such as um, pension funds, invest um, insurance company, they've owned it for quite some time. But if we look to when private individuals, you and I, could, could buy student accommodation, it started in Liverpool probably about 2011, 2012, with a company called Middle England Developments, MED. And they created this model where private individuals could buy a, a, a unit two units within within a converted in those days a converted um building close to universities so it started as we spoke about sort of um shared rooms or rooms rather sharing the same facilities so bathroom and kitchen so you might have a cluster of four to eight rooms sharing a single bathroom a single mm -hmm. kitchen and, and as some of those pictures showed you know the nightmare that that, that didn't give very quickly, 2012, 11, 13, it moved on to maybe an ensuite room, but still sharing kitchen facilities. So we have the, 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 the sort of ensuite bathroom, shared kitchen. And then probably about 2014, a lot of the developers went into what I would call true purpose-built student accommodation. So they went into true studios um, where you have your own kitchen, your own bathroom, but within the block, you might have communal facilities um, such as gymnasium, lounge, laundry, that sort of thing. So essentially, as it's saying, what is PBSA? First built student accommodation. A lot of it is governed by the planning. So the local councils giving planning permission. It is purely for student occupation. You can't use it for residential. And that has some, some added benefits. Some people look at it maybe as a, as a negative it's only a student that can use it but there are certain benefits which shane will talk about later with regards to sdlt stamp duty and an element of council tax a, a, a true student won't be paying council tax so uh, some added benefits by, by buying into pbsa and what pbsa offers i think one of the one of the key things which we've shown there is that you have a dedicated management company currently the developments we 
We have sold and worked with its urban student life, homes for students, student facility management, and they will manage the block far better than an HMO or, or possibly even far better than um, halls of residence. And, it, and it's that strength of management that it is key to the success of, um, of these blocks, these um, PBSAs. So in a word, that's what it is, purpose-built student accommodation aimed solely at students. No, well, put Andrew on that. I mean, and these images on the screen now, these are actually CGI. So rather than just show you that, we've actually got a real life walkthrough uh, Matterport link. Even yeah. You call it Matt Horn, don't you? But a Matterport link where we can show you through. I think Jason's going to put it on the screen now. This is one London road. So this is one that's completed about two, three months ago now, wasn't it? Yeah. Months one and two. Uh, so this is a real life walkthrough of what it actually looks like um, in there. So you've got the concierge bit on there. If you just... Uh, walk us through to the lounge area, Jess, please. This is not a computer-generated image. This is a, an actual <laughs> video. Yeah. So uh, just just so that you know. Yeah. Um, so you can see the lounge area. But here's it's got the pool table. There's plasma TVs as well on the walls. You've got coffee making facilities. Almost too good for students in some ways, you'd say. But this shows you the real standard. We mentioned it before how much it's improved, mm. and even just in the last three years i would say it's massively improved yeah and when we first started selling student property i think the concept so is I, the I think concept is if you put people in a pigsty they'll treat yeah. it like a pigsty you put them into something like this that, that's got good quality good furniture yeah. they will look after it um and we found that uh, looking at keel house now yeah you know still walking around keel house five mm -hmm. years six years on after it's been completed and it's still spotless yeah. and the management company will go round and and repaint and touch up the the the, the and replace fixtures and fittings and furniture that might be uh, worn mm -hmm. over a period of time but generally it stood its it, the test of time yeah and they cleaned every every other day i think in these communal mm -hmm. areas aren't they compared to like we said before hmos where i mean management companies will tell landlords they'll check on them but they don't no. really it's at the end of each year is when they have a look at it there um, so this is the gym in one of the other blocks in One London Road. Um, again, I mean, this for actually for a board, this is quite a small gym. Yeah. They're normally much bigger than this, and he's got one coming up in block four, which is much bigger. But even this in itself is such a good standard compared to some of the gyms we saw in purpose-built student accommodation even three, four years ago, where it was a tiny room that would have a couple of bikes or a rowing machine in there, and that was what they classed as a gym. Yeah. Now it's much more different. You can see the free weights and everything like that included there. So... Yeah. yeah, and that's included in the rent as well, isn't it, for students? You yeah. want to say on it as well. So. I mean, how much is a gym member? A decent, a gym, decent gym membership is like nearly 50 quid a, a month. Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're, they're getting this free, and it's always kept clean, always kept tidy. And there's, yeah. I mean, Keel House, there's a big area, a studio area for um, uh, exercising, not just the weights, yeah. not just the gym equipment. And it's then the sort of things that's going to grab the students' attention, which is yeah. important, isn't it? They look at the gym and think, right, I want that. Get on to their mum and dad. This is where I want to stay. And that's hugely important. So this is one of the actual studio apartments. So you can see here um, we've got the kitchenette facilities. So you have uh, the built-in oven and hob, uh, the double bed. That comes with a fridge and small little freezer part of it as well. You've got the storage. The ensuite, Jason, if you can just quickly show us that, just to give them an idea. I feel dizzy watching Jess do this. Um, so you can see that really good quality. Um, and as Mike says, they're really well looked after as well. Quite uniquely on One London Road, they have a roof terrace, which uh, on cue, there we go. Um, and again, it just shows you the extra care and extra detail this developer's gone to. That actual space there, I mean, you could probably get what you say, guys, number four, five studios maybe on there if you'd wanted to yeah. at 70,000 a unit. So there's much more money you could have made from doing it like that. But he's made it look good overall and, and built into a community. So, yeah, I mean, it's stunning up on there, isn't it? We've been on to, yeah. to look down yeah. on it. So. Um, With a view across the park at the back. Is, uh, yeah. yeah, and they're, and they're on a few of the blocks, aren't they? That I think block, block one and four. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea before we start going into the benefits and everything like that of exactly what are we talking about and not just fancy CGI's and brochures that we've all seen, but real life, what do they look like? Mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully you agree, they're really impressive. And if you ever wanted to go and have a look at them, 
we've we've shown you around. We've shown absolutely. Lots of past, but, and, and also, if you want to link to the to to the Matterport video as well, that's uh, that's readily available. Jason, will I'll post that up for you. Yeah. Great stuff. So, um, John, do you have the ominous task of talking about COVID? I get all the good tasks. <laughs> I, I get, you know, I got uh, I got Brexit, and now I've got COVID. Uh, no, I haven't got COVID. Um, so basically, um, how did P PBSA has affected everything? Um, uh, uh, sorry, COVID has affected everything. Um, the chart on the right. It just shows you really how our students think their accommodation provider has responded to their needs during COVID. Um, and and that, that correlates to whether or not that they would recommend their provider to someone else. So generally, it's all been positive. They've worked well together. They provided, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, hand washing facilities, etc., and, and kept uh, a distance from the students and give them their own space. But generally speaking, but the, even though uh, we, we've lost a lot of people um, going home, uh, leaving university, pulling out of their course, uh, doing things remotely, that's obviously affected the numbers in this year. However, the long-term uh, uh, attraction of PBSA is that people want to socially distance now. They want to have that extra room. They want to do their own cleaning and washing. They don't want to share um, rooms in, in, in HMOs with people that they don't really know and people, different people coming and going all of the time. Um, so people are looking for their own space um, and, and uh, you know, they don't, they don't really want to share facilities. So it's actually made it more popular, hasn't it? PBSA. Absolutely. Hugely. Hugely. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, if they, they were becoming more popular anyway. To, pe pe I mean, people like their own space a bit now, don't they? Yeah. We're a bit more unsocial maybe these days, but on it. But yeah, I think people prefer it. Um, and that's an interesting little graph. Hopefully, you can see that chart in there as well, which actually shows how positive students believe their management companies reacted. Mm. to COVID-19. Yeah. Again, highlights the importance of having that management company in place and someone who not only landlords can turn to, but the students themselves can turn to yeah. and feel at, at home and, and they're safe with that. So. And, and the positive moving forward now for the next few years it is a great opportunity for investors because um, those people who have deferred in their courses are now wanting to come back to university and complete their courses and that's absolutely mobbing the universities now. And obviously, it's it's mobbing purpose-built student accommodation as well, because that is the most the, the, the most uh, uh, wanted. Um, there's a build-up, isn't there? Like you said, people have deferred their years. I, we feel like there's going to be a big influx in there of students next year. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Like, I mean, it's clear it's that we're, we're going to be record numbers again uh, for, for, for people uh, applying for university. Mm -hmm. But also, we've got those coming back that have deferred from from before. So, before yeah. we miss out, uh, Rowan's uh, kindly sent us a message, uh, John, that saying that management companies' fees per month would these be billed separately? I mean, typically with PBSAs, we'll come on to there are rental guarantees put in place, aren't there, by developers, mm. and those management fees are incorporated in that and already taken off for their net figure. On it, but you're normally looking at about about eight percent, aren't there? Is roughly yeah. what a student management company would typically charge on it. Um, They'll normally bundle it in with the service charge because generally speaking, the management company will also be responsible for uh, the lettings as well as the management of the site services. So typically, if you're looking at buying a student property now, 12, 13, 1400 pounds per year, you would pay uh, for a studio apartment as a, as, as a management fee. And then you've got your ground rent, which is separate. Yeah. But if you, if you you know if you're looking at something like a an eight uh, eight eight and a half percent return now as a guarantee, mm -hmm. that's included in that. So whenever you see uh, net returns uh, with student accommodation, everything's normally included apart from the ground rent, because normally the freeholder will be separate. That is. The freeholder will be sold on to another company, and you will pay that other company totally separate. And that will normally be sort of three, 
three, three fifty, four hundred pounds per year. Good. Anything more you want to add, uh, Mike? No, that's fine. On the, COVID. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. We've been mentioning COVID all the way through anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> on that side of it, Mike, were you talking about the the demand? I think it was in in the Telegraph last Saturday. They were talking about the likes of Coventry University and their medical section. Even for 21, 22 academic year, it's oversubscribed. So Coventry, I'm sure it was Coventry, are offering to defer it to 22, 23 academic year, but offering students a, a cash incentive to do that. And you think it's quite something when you look at, I think it was 10,000 pounds they were offering as a cash incentive to defer an additional year. Um, quite a, quite a, a statement by Coventry to, to say, you know, we're fully subscribed and we physically can't take any more. Uh, and again, the likes of Man Met, my daughter lectures at, at Man Met. Last year, she had five master, uh, master's students to, to work with. This year, it's talking about maybe 30. And they're thinking, can we actually handle 30? Are we hitting a level where, um, you know, we're going to have to defer some of those? So I think looking at numbers for students very much, it, this year, this academic year is going to be sort of back to 2019 and, and over and above 2019 numbers. <laughs> And that's why the university themselves, Andrew, want PBSA built, don't they? Like this, oh, that's so. they can grow really if they, you know, if they haven't got the accommodations to back it up, their numbers can't really grow. So, um, no, that's, that's that's right, Mike. You look at again, referring to Keel, we know Keel University very well. You know, they've, they've got 10, 11,000 students, facility of two and a half thousand rooms. A lot of people will be traveling into Keel and that, or any university, and that might be the difference between someone saying, Yes, I'll come to Keel, or I might go to Liverpool or Manchester subject to the accommodation um so yeah very much so and, and johnsy made reference before if you went to uni in 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 the 80s 90s and noughties forget what you you imagine and certainly um not to cry mike's age there but we 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 don't we remember those um hmos and i think if you look at um the accommodation that is on offer now and has been probably for maybe five years now the standard of accommodation is very much like a hotel, and that is what the students are demanding, certainly the overseas students. Um, my, my holiday and I have been to, to China a few times, and you talk to Chinese investors and you talk to them about their children coming to the UK, they want top quality accommodation. They've only got maybe got one child, they're willing to send that child to the UK for education, but they don't want them in, a, in an HMO or, or maybe even halls. They want them in purpose-built student accommodation that offers that level of facility, that security that goes with it, the concierge on the front during the day, CCTV, and, and that is an element of what has driven the demand for Purpose Built, the, the, the quality that students are looking for today, that hotel accommodation. Yeah, for me it's the security as well. You know, if you've got a, your daughter leaving home for the first time and she's living, uh, uh, she's, she's living in a HMO a few miles away from the university, uh, you know, walking home by herself in uh, badly lit streets, you know, there's a good chance if she's going back to the halls of residence, well, the PBSA, that with the number of people there, you've got more chance of her having somebody to walk back with. And they're usually along main in in, in highly populated areas, uh, not just in, in in a sort of a housing estate or in a suburb like many HMOs are. So it's that security of knowing that you your child's going to be all right, they're going to be safe. Especially for overseas mm. clients, isn't it? Um, and a lot of overseas students, they will stay all year as well. Because generally speaking, what we've found is the families come to the UK to visit the children, as opposed to the children going back home uh, out of term time. So with them being there for the full year, um, you know, they, they want to be comfortable and they want to have their own space and they're willing to pay that little bit more for them to have that comfort. So moving on to the pros and cons of um, PBSA. So um, I'm going to be glass half empty. Yeah, I'm so going to be glass you, half You can full. be positive on this. So you can talk about the positives, John, and I'll then get on to the negatives. Well, firstly, I'd say, I mean, a massive one here. There's a massive demand for uh, PBSA and generally student accommodation in in the UK. I mean, even we, we've been dealing in Keel 
Uh, now, the Keele University <coughs> has been said to have a shortage of 8,000 beds in the area. Not sure how accurate that is, but we do know from the hospital that they're putting on special buses for people who live outside the area to transport them back to university because they can't get anywhere locally. Newcastle underline is not a, a big city. It's, it's an area that's populated with residential houses and not the type that you're going to turn into HMOs as well. I think there's only one other apartment block in Newcastle that, that is non-student. So there's not other options for it, but there's a huge demand for, for, for uh, uh, student accommodation across the UK. Yeah. It's like negative. Um, typically, you can't get finance on student property, mainly due to the size of mm -hmm. the apartment. So because they tend to be below 30 square metres, lenders will not look at that. So they, they're cash purchases on it. But certainly the, the student properties that we sell, you're talking around the 60, 70, 80,000 pound mark. So not huge money um, in that sense. But yeah, pretty much cash only um, on that front. They're usually fully managed and hands-free. Uh, if you're using a good operator and a good agent, uh, you know, all you'll get is that statement. A lot of them now have a, a, an online book, uh, an online sort of portal that you can check uh, that your, your rent's landed uh, and and uh, that your apartment's occupied. People just, it just ticks over. You know, you just get that statement. You don't have to worry about ever fa having phone calls about it. And people love it, particularly overseas people, because they, they can't get involved. And then UK-wide static rental figures. So what we mean by that is take London to one side. Pretty much rental figures throughout PBSA is very similar from whatever location it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but that's, I'd say that's a negative and a positive in some areas because in areas where prices are much lower, your yields are certainly much higher with them rents. Um, but I suppose it's slightly negative on the bigger cities, which we'll touch on as well on that front where you may be going to pay much higher purchase prices, but your rents are the same as those secondary areas uh, that we touched on. It. It's a matter of identifying those areas, Mike, is. That, that, mm -hmm. is, that are little gems because, yeah. you know, a lot of people think, well, we'll just... We want to buy a student property. Let's buy it in Manchester. Let's buy it in Liverpool because they're the places where, you know, that 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 you know, we've heard of that they got really good universities. <laughs> Means nothing, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, and and uh, I that, think particularly that, overseas clients don't they sometimes. Yeah, they get yeah. in heads. You know, they've heard like you say that Manchester's the place to invest. They hear student property is a good sector, and they try and put the two together. Exactly, and it just doesn't really work like that, does it? No, um, no. That, which we've got some good infographics on that uh, later on. Back to the positive. Back to the positives. Uh, the guarantees, people love guarantees because they know exactly how much they're getting. And even if their actual rent is slightly higher than the guarantee, it doesn't matter because you know you're getting. And if you're getting an, an, an eight, eight and a half, maybe even in some cases 9% guaranteed return over a period of three years, that just gives you a head start. I don't get, don't be thinking, a lot of people, a lot of naysayers out there will say oh they just add it to the price and they're just giving it as a cash back not the case with student property it can be the case with some buy to lets where the guarantee is much higher than the actual market rent not in student accommodation you are going to get the exact rent that's received from the from the student it is then if 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 required it is topped up and underwritten by the developer well, I mean, the way to test it is take the guarantee off it. Mm. Look, and we often put that to clients, don't we? So look at what rents it's going to bring in. Look at the management fees, the service charge, and see what it naturally yields. And it should, if it's a good PBSA, how it's been sold, mm. match up with the rental guarantee. That's how myself and Paul, when we're bringing on student projects, that's the first thing we do. Because developers will say, look, here's the guarantee. We take it away and yeah. look at what it naturally yields. So that it's important after the guarantee period, it's going to carry on at that, that level as well. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, you, you look at something like Orm House at the moment, which is which is completed and up and running. Uh, we ju just had one of our resale properties there rent 51 weeks at £155 per week. Um, you take the service charge off of £1,400, £1,350, uh, and, and the ground rent, and you're left with around £6,500 six, six, six £6 per, uh, uh, per year, which is... You know, they're, they're priced at around 60, 
63,000. So that equates to around sort of 9%. So they are continuing to, to, to rent at that level yeah. and will continue to do so, providing it's a good development in the right, the best area, um, it will continue to do so, it will continue to increase. Rowan's asked another question, is there options for payment plans with developers during the construction programme? Yeah, there is, Rowan. On every PBSA I've seen off plan, there's always been a payment plan that they're in place. Yeah. Typically, you're talking about 50% of the purchase prices due on exchange of contracts. You then normally have a stage payment of around about 25% of the purchase mm. price, isn't it? Which is maybe six, seven months into the build and then the final amount on completion. And what a lot of developers do, they actually offer interest on your deposited funds. So again, a, a typical figure, 4% interest is normally the one, isn't it, that they mm. offer. So from when you exchange contracts, 4% interest is accrued on that money and deducted from your final payment. So yeah, even though I mentioned before, it's, it's cash purchases there is a way you sort of phase that out as well uh, so yeah well prompted bro, bro that was a good question um slight negative low capital appreciation i mean we always say it's not you shouldn't buy pbsa for capital growth it's not that type of property investment um that's not to say it's going to drop in value i mean resales which andrew will touch on later on um they go very well with pbsa um and can sell really quickly so they certainly hold their own and they're valued on the red and the yield um so, but yeah, don't buy it if you think you're going to get huge growth. That's not what they're here for. They are big income generators that are going to stay in your portfolio for a long time because you shouldn't really want to sell them. That's yeah. it. And they're also low price. So, you know, what 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 can you expect? I mean, okay, in five years, a, a £65,000 studio might be worth £80,000 in five years' time. It's only fifteen thousand pounds. Take out your legal fees and your reselling costs. You might only be left with ten thousand pounds. So it's not a huge amount of money anyway. But the thing that people buy it for, as Mike said, is the guarantee and the big income. So you know exactly how much you're getting. Yeah. Um, and finally, uh, something that we're going to come on to now uh, with, uh, with with Shane Mockler. Um, from CapEx Associates. Right on cue, I think, John Z. It's just joined us. I was worried there, Shane, that you weren't going to appear. Good evening, all. Can you hear me? We yeah. can, yeah. Fantastic. There's, there's no stamp duty up to 125,000, but I'll not go into that. I'll let Shane take over and uh, uh, take the floor. And uh, over to you, Shane. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys. So, good evening, all. I'm going to speak to you for no longer than five minutes regarding some stamp duty relief that could save you thousands of pounds. Don't worry, there's only three categories to discuss. I'm not going to bore you with chapter and verse of tax law. But before I do go into that, and so I can make it all relevant to you, there are a couple of areas within stamp duty that I'd just like to explain so that the, so that the subsequent information makes sense. So they are, first of all, it's higher rates for additional dwellings. Now, if I could see you all, I'd ask for a show of hands. Um, who knows what this is? But what I'm going to do is just explain it in its most simplest form, um, which means that essentially you pay a 3% surcharge rate of stamp duty on any additional dwelling. Now, what is an additional dwelling? An additional dwelling is simply a property other than the house that you live in. The other one is multiple dwelling relief or MDR as it's known. In this most in its most simplest form, it means that where the more than one dwelling is being purchased, you can essentially split the total acquisition price, um, which usually saves some sort of quite large sums. Now, to introduce the tax and touching on what Michael said at the start of the uh, start of the meeting. Now, until March of this year, HMRC haven't really published any guidance based on the legislation. So there's always been some grey areas in stamp duty land tax. But as well as that, over the past few years, student accommodation has become increasingly popular amongst investors. Now, why do you guys think that is? I mean, for me personally, I feel that as well as a shortage of supply, committed 12 month tenancies, high yields and council tax exemptions. One reason is because of student landlords can qualify for stamp duty land tax relief, where the higher rates for additional dwellings, as mentioned earlier, are exempt. Now, onto the three areas as discussed, so please hold on to your hats all. Category one, although this isn't going to be applicable to the large majority of investors, it's prudent to differentiate um, the difference between them. Student halls of residence, usually owned and or managed by the educational institutions that the students attend, are for some purposes not capable of being classified as a dwelling. 
So essentially what this means is that they're outside the scope for the, the higher rates and for multiple dwelling relief. A prime example of this is a property owned by the university on the main campus. <clears throat> now, what this means is that HMRC and the government classify these properties as non-residential. So they'll be charged at the non-residential rates, just like any shop, industrial unit or hotel would be. Category two is the main, this is the main area of interest for all of you, sp specifically for PBSA. So regular student accommodation, other than halls of residence that are owned by private landlords and obliged to be, that's the, uh, the word, obliged to be for the sole benefit of students are charged to the residential rates of stamp duty, but exempt from the higher rates. Multiple dwelling relief would be available in this instance too. As mentioned, that an example of this is purpose-built student accommodation. This is the, the bread and butter qualifying uh, type of property, to be honest. What this means for stamp duty purposes is that if you buy student units for under £125,000 or indeed £250,000 until the end of September, then you shouldn't pay any stamp duty at all. Category three, pretty much exactly the same as category two. Um, however, this is an instance where the properties are not obliged to be for students. So they're treated as residential, um, but the higher rates are chargeable. Now, an example of this is a HMO that is rented to both students and non-students, or potentially students and staff members at the university. What this means is that the purchase for stamp duty purposes will be treated as any other regular buy-to-let investment, really. Okay, so for those of you guys that are still awake after all of that, this covers the three areas of student accommodation and hopefully provides you with some information to consider. If knowing this relief makes student investing more appealing to you, then great, as this was the intention of the government who actually created the legislation. So what I'd now like to do, guys, is um, that's enough from, uh, enough from me. So I'd like to open up to any questions firstly on the panel um, and then anyone who's, um, anyone who's listening. Well, I mean, thanks very much, Shane. Really appreciate that. You summarised it really well. I mean, there may be some investors on this webinar that have perhaps wrongly paid stamp duty on um, properties that they've recently completed on or a couple of years ago. Is there a service you can offer for those clients to help claim some of that back or is it just from now onwards? It's a good question you asked. Now, essentially, the, the way HMRC advise is that within a 12-month period from the purchase date, that's the prime opportunity to um, sort of recover those funds, so to speak. But we can actually go past four years. As I mentioned, the, the, the guidance from HMRC has been so lacking in the past um, until this year that that's a good argument for any um, properties up until four years in the past to be able to um, reclaim, essentially. On the on the overseas side of it, Shane, um, yeah. that 2% non-UK resident uh, SDLT, will that be applicable? Will, will overseas investors be paying that 2%? It's a good question. And the answer to that is yes, they will. Um, now, the, the way that they've worded the legislation, although the higher rates didn't apply, um, the non-resident rates will apply. Um, essentially, what that means is that, as I mentioned before, up to £125,000, instead of paying nothing, you'll be paying 2% for these residents. Now, a lot of overseas investors are buying multiple units in one go. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail, but when you buy multiple units in one go, the minimum amount that you will pay is 1% of the total transaction price, whereas what overseas investors are doing is paying 2%. So really, when you're buying multiples, there's not much of a, um, a scope to be put off for overseas investors, if that all makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, Patrick's just uh, asked a question, Shane. I don't know if you can see that. Um, he said, nothing here for student HMOs, or have I misunderstood? Um, do you want to just quickly clarify for Patrick's purposes on the stamp, uh, stamp duty for student HMOs? Yeah, of course. So student HMOs, if they are obliged to be for students now, PBSA is quite an easily identifiable qualifying criteria. One of the main pieces of evidence that we have to provide to HMRC, <clears throat> excuse me, is that this the properties are obliged to be solely for students. So PBSA, as I say, great example, but that doesn't mean HMOs aren't included. No, we can actually also claim for HMOs, but the main criteria would be that at the point you purchase it, it needs to be operating as student investment. So let's say, for example, you've bought it off a family who are using it um, as their residential home, that's more difficult to qualify. But what I would um, suggest is that if, if you do have an inquiry, every case is different. So please feel free to reach out and I'll uh, happily advise. 
That's great. And yeah, as, as Shane says, anyone who wants to speak to Shane, uh, we'll send the um, link across to people and we can make an introduction that way. Um, I think there's actually a page on our website which uh, Jason's created, so hopefully that will be on the right-hand side as well, okay. which you're welcome to click on and book a consultation with him on it. Uh, Rowan has just asked another question. On buy-to-let properties for students, do they have to be brand new or can they be refurbished, refurbished to qualify, Shane? Um, they can be brand new or refurbished, to be honest with you. Um, the main reason why the relief is available is because of the shortage, really, of, of student accommodation. Um, and because that's what the government are looking for people to invest in, to invest in people's futures. Um, so, yes, you can qualify refurbished homes. But as I say, it would need to be some form of interaction with the criteria is being used as a student let at the point of purchase um, now. That's the that's the narrative. You can read into that at what you what you will really. You know, you could argue that if you put the relevant insurances in place um, and you change the council tax rates, then what that would mean is that that already qualifies at the point of purchase. But as I say, every case is different, so the, the potential is there to qualify that. And that might relate to Patrick's new question you just put in there, Shane, um, that his properties are refurbished and during his ownership. So he's asked if there's were if there's any mileage there worth uh, speaking with yourself as he bought them in late 2019, um, and one last month which isn't yet registered. So, I'm so yes, worth a chat, Shane, on that with Patrick. Yeah, definitely. Um, just as I, as I mentioned before, there's a, there's some relief that when it goes to the point of 12 months after the point of purchase, HMRC just won't look at. You know what people don't realise is there's 49 reliefs and exemptions now the particular relief we're mentioning has been so difficult for people to qualify and has caused so many issues in this industry purely because their guidance wasn't up to standard until recently so definitely anything until 2017 to be honest we can look at and sometimes solicitors don't help shit do they from our experience we get some that tell well this is, you some that say don't it's yeah it's a great point you make now solicitors are appointed by hmrc to collect the funds on their behalf the reason that they're appointed is because they're the best place to do it. You know, the solicitors can make sure that the properties don't complete until everything's in order. So they're best place to do it. But what HMRC are asking by that is they're asking legal professionals who have spent years to acquire their status to give tax advice, which will then take um, more years to learn in, in that regard as well. So it creates an advice vacuum whereby so many transactions overpay. It's estimated that it's one in four transactions overpay. And to be honest, I can believe that. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's really useful. And Patrick's saying there for you to uh, talk after this, Shane, on that. So, and I'm sure right. you're more watching as well. That'll be key for it. So, Perfect. yeah, a big, a big thank you from us, Shane. That's cleared up a lot mm. for us. It really helps. So, um, yeah, thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. Thank you, guys. So, moving on, I think this Andrew is your section in terms of the exit side of student property. There's a lot of myths out there that you can't resell. PBSA um, and Andrew, who you head up that side of our uh, company in the resale side, so hopefully you can answer some of those on that. Certainly can, Mike. I think mentioned earlier, it is one of the key points that the, the new in investor into student understands the concept, understands the model, but like any investment, it's only a good investment if you can exit the, uh, the, the, the asset that you bought. So is there a market? Yeah, 100% there's a market. Um, let's look at maybe why you would you you would look to buy purpose built completed um, as a resale? We've got three examples here, and you know if we talk through them, um, all house completed 2019, Keel 2017, and Chapel Street in Manchester 2013. And I think if we it might with reference to to capital growth, I personally would never sell you a, a student scheme on uh, on capital growth. I'd sell it on the yield it's going to make and the solid yield that it can continue to make over the years. So if you look at these three, they're all selling at, at what the people bought them at, at what the completion price was in 17 and, and, and even as far back as 2013. I mean, if we, if we look though at the rents, so we're not going to see capital growth, but we will see rental growth. Now, Ormhouse unfortunately completed October 19, so it, it, it got very quickly into the COVID scenario. But if we look at Keel, 2017, Rent started at about 125. We're now up to 140, 145. So we've seen, you know, 15, 20 pound increase over over a four year period, including a, a fairly torrid 18 months during COVID. 
but I think Chapel Street is the main one to look at for rental growth. Completed 2013, built by X1, managed by X1. We saw the rent start at about £100 a month, sorry, a week, and then now currently at 142 and the ones we've just sold are projected to be 145 this coming September. So you're looking at, say, a 45% uplift in rental values over an eight-year period. And I think talking of longevity, we personally, and I know Mike agrees, that you should be buying student for a five to 10-year, maybe even longer than a 10-year term. And, and you look at Chapel Street, very few have been sold. And, and you know the guy that's just sold to that through ourselves had owned them for the eight years. And you think that's that's where the, the value is, where you're looking at a long-term investment producing, in this instance, currently it's producing 6.25. But all, as Minecraft mentioned, you know, it, it, it's got that rent on all, but 155 or 51 yeah. term, it's producing close to 9% returns. And, and that's what you're buying into. And that is what your, your, your buyer, when you come to sell, will be buying into. And some of that, is relative to the strength of the management company that we mentioned earlier, USL, Homes for Students. It's that strength that they bring to the, to the management to maintain the value of the asset you've bought. If we looked at those images of HMO, if you had that form of management within the, the development, your value would actually diminish. So instead of it being an asset, it would become potentially a liability. And I think Andrew as well, I mean, the majority of investors that we sell to purchase off plan, which can be quite a daunting prospect, kind of. I mean, we've been to many a sites where there's nothing to see and um, you've got to use your imagination. Um, so, but then flip that forward to the resale side, those people are then seeing something completed, ready to go, instant income. It's easy to see why there is a big market on that side as well. Um, probably more people, I would say, are more comfortable that way, which helps with the resale side. I think you're right, Mike. I mean, you and I have both been there at London Road where we saw the um, that, that walkthrough earlier. And we were there in 2016, would it have been maybe 2017? Yeah. Still on the site of, 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 it's a raised site initially, looking down on the, on the development site and thinking, <laughs> what are we looking at here? We're looking at sort of a fairly overgrown, barren site and, and trying to explain to people where the five blocks of London Road will go. And I'm sure... Some of those investors probably thought, what are these two lads talking about? You know, that they don't have the vision. And, I, and as Mike has just said, the attraction completed, it's going to give you instant returns. You can go and look at it. You can touch it. You can feel it. And again, going back maybe to the, some of the older developments, you've got the history of the rental. So you can look at Chapel Street, eight years worth of rent. What were the rents? How well did it rent? Deal house, four years. What has the rent been over those four years? How's it been rented? The likes of um, the ones we currently have available, they're all pre-booked for this coming academic year. So again, you've got that knowledge that you may be buying it today, and we're talking sort of you know, end of end of July, nearly into August, but you've got a, a tenant lined up for September of next year, and you know the rate at which, at which it's going to be um, tenanted at. So one of the reasons why you would buy completed, we're also finding, I think, certainly with maybe the likes of Keel House and, and Orm House accredited, and, and, and I think it was John Z made reference, these these developments become accredited to the to the university to which they're closest to. And the likes of Keel and Orm House both accredited to uh, to Keel University, which sort of puts them up the ladder as to where people may wish to, to, to rent as a student. But we're finding that parents are looking to buy into that accommodation. Certainly Keel, where you've got a very strong medical um, facility, veterinary, you're talking of five, maybe a seven-year course. And as my reference there, you know, the, the rent is close to £8,000 a year. So if you take that sort of rent at £8,000 a year over a five-year term, you're talking five, eight, you know, £40,000. You buy into Keel House or, or Orm House at sort of 55, 65,000, and a lot of that rental has is used actually by the, the, the acquisition that your, your son or daughter is going to live in. So we're finding a lot of people looking to buy for children going to that university. And the attraction then at the end of that term, you can then rent it out or sell it on to someone in a similar position. Um, we, we're finding that HMO 
councils are looking to to try and alleviate the HMO, and we made reference to Liverpool. There were huge swathes of Liverpool up Smithdown Road from sort of the Finch and Birkin pub at the bottom end of sort of probably Gainsborough Road there, right the way through up to Tunnel Road on, along Smithdown. There was just student land. And of those images we saw earlier under the HMO, and, and the councils are, are very keen to, to come away from that side, get the students into, into purpose-built accommodation, <coughs> to a degree free up that, that HMO into family ownership. If I think it was a Savills report probably three or four years ago that said if, if all the students left the HMO, it would release something like 600,000 homes into the, uh, into the market, into the private family market. And that's what we're looking at. The demand for completed tenanted student accommodation is great. So wrap it up. Is there an exit strategy? Most definitely. The one caveat I would put on that is the timescales in which those transactions can take. Um, if you're buying off plan, if you're buying um, something such as, say, the villas that we'll talk about earlier, you could be looking at a four-week, five-week um, transaction. On the resale side of it, you're probably looking at a three- to four-month transaction. So whilst we're talking about immediate returns, it can be a bit slower. The actual getting to that end point can be slower. So but, definitely um, market. And I think to paint that, though, Andrew, the speed of sale can be exceptional, can't it? To give some examples, we had um, two resales in uh, Preston, didn't we, Canterbury Halls? Yes. They must have sold out in under three hours, was it? By the time we listed it, it was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. So you got them away in, in lightning speed. And, and whilst we've been talking about no capital growth, this client who, who's selling the two in Canterbury, as you say, is probably, if my brain works quickly enough, close to maybe... 8% capital growth, something like yeah. that, in what, two years? Um, it was around about 10k uplift, wasn't it? So, um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, that capital growth in that instance and resell, as you say, <coughs> within probably three hours, they were uh, away. And if anyone has any um, PBSA property that they're looking to resell, please do get in touch. Andrew will be more than happy to, uh, to speak to you on that front as well. Uh, I mean, yeah. You know, that, on that, Mike, if we look at you know what we currently have and what we have sold in the past year, past year, Libertus in Liverpool, London Road in Newcastle, Keel, Orm in Newcastle, um, Chapel Street in Manchester, uh, Seal in Liverpool. So we, we've, we've got quite a history of resales behind us. Currently, we have nine going through in um, Keel House. I think it's four in Keel House, one in Orm, and um, the three in Canterbury. So uh, oh, one in Chapel as well. So steady strong market speed of sale is get the price right get the management right they'll sell quickly yeah as i said yeah. if you prefer to buy resale property and you want something completed we have options there if you've got um completed property and looking to sell again we've got options so get in touch on the, on that front so uh, moving on so this chart here shows exactly what it is that students look for themselves when they're choosing on where they want to stay um, when they go into university, which I think, as I mentioned before, is incredibly important, isn't it? Yeah. Um, who, what they're going to say to their parents is, look, this is where I want to stay. Um, so this was a report done by Knight Frank, which I'm sure a lot of you will have come across them uh, before. But interestingly, the number one thing is the fast Wi-Fi yeah. included, which a lot of the PBSA blocks now actually have their own direct line without going... Too technical. They're direct line, don't they? Yeah, it's, I think it's called a lease line, where right. they actually they actually lease the the actual fiber optic cable going into the building. Makes it quicker. It's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's the, the better way, but and much uh, quicker as well than some of them. So, and up there as well, larger bedrooms obviously important to people. The gyms, um, they're really high. That doesn't surprise me on that front. Um, some have mentioned about uh, the cinema room, so down there and, and bike hire. One interesting one, which I think will actually grow over time, the in-house events thing. I know that's very low at that point, but a lot of these purpose-built blocks, I'm thinking the likes of London Road, they're trying to create a bit of a community, aren't they, and organise yeah. events and games, that sort of thing, in the shared areas. I think that will grow over time. It's probably low because of COVID at the moment and yeah. people not wanting to socialise as much, but over time, I think that will become quite an important thing. Well, most of them on there are very important. Mm. So it may, it may not be seen as something that's going to be a, um, a a deal breaker. But actually, when people are in, we find that it really encourages them to stay. 
because there is a sense of community. Well, this is what developers look at, don't they? When they're designing mm. their projects, you know, what is it that's because, as we mentioned before, a lot of these developers are offering rental guarantees. So it's absolutely in their interest to make sure they are going to fill mm. their blocks. So they need to know that their students will want to stay in their blocks. So this is why it's important to, to them on that front. Um, and it's evolving as well all the time. You, you can see student apartments that we sold sort of five, six, seven years ago. Uh, that what's coming on, on online now is of a dis different class. And that's what I would say with resales. With resales, you do have the security of it being completed. But you, you are, you know, the technology isn't going to be the same mm -hmm. as it is mm -hmm. now. And you've also got the added advantage of, you know, if you're buying off plan, generally you're securing mm -hmm. higher returns as well. So there is a big advantage for some people of, of thinking that this, it's more secure buying buying completed but there's some significant advantages particularly in uh the speed of the wi-fi the actual line going in uh, unless it's been upgraded of course by the management company that'll come down to the uh, to the um how good the management company are and i think if you're an investor <coughs> you're looking at purchasing in pbsa look out for these type of things in it and mm -hmm. you, know, you might see brochures as i mentioned before where they say there's going to be a gym well actually my tip from me is actually look at the floor plans on it and see if it's a big enough area to have a substantial gym or a lounge area in it. Um, and if it does, it's a big tick, isn't it? Yeah. On that front. Uh, don't just take what it says on the brochure. Look at floor plans and go that bit extra as well. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, talking on, on the Wi-Fi side of it, talking from my own experience, when, when we, years ago, 2012, we, I saw the development in Liverpool called Borden Court, again an X1. Um, the developer thought he had the fastest broadband he could get in there, Hundred and something rooms in Borden Court within a week. The students <coughs> crashed the Wi-Fi, and it was then it took him oh I don't know probably three months to upgrade that line to a level where they could um, they could get it working again. So Wi-Fi is very much important, and I think as modern technologies do improve and more students are streaming and and you know talking to my daughters a lot of the tutorials are then available online, so they'll attend the tutorial. But then they can go back to their room, re-watch it, re-listen to it, and all that sort of streaming. You, you can think, you know, maybe, say, Keel House, 160 rooms in there. If all the students are in there streaming at one go, the demand on Wi-Fi is, is immense. And I can see why it's top of the, top of the table there for um, student facilities. Absolutely. So um, where to buy? It's a really important question. Um, on that, hopefully, John Z, you're going to be able to answer that <laughs> question for, for people on that. Well, I mean, the, let's have a look at the graph initially. Um, this graph shows really it's the average monthly rent for PBSAs in different areas. And the first of the one that stands out is London, but that's no shock for, for most property uh, maps. Uh, uh, you know, the uh, values and, and rents are always higher in London because of the cost of the land there uh, but generally speaking if you take it bristol at 174 uh, pounds uh, per week and sheffield at the, at the bottom end at 124 uh, pounds per week there is a huge difference if you actually look at the difference in the pricing uh now the difference in the pricing could be huge i mean we've just seen come to market one in cardiff and it is Vita who are a good uh, operator. Um, but one in Cardiff priced, uh, it's a high-rise block, um, not not particularly close to the university. Uh, and the apartments there are 150 to 250K. So compare that to something like, uh, you know, in Newcastle under Lyme where we're, we're, we're selling at sort of 75 the difference it can be huge. So, well, I think Cardiff's on there, John Z, isn't it? So, I mean, mm. that's down there on average. I think it's one hundred and thirty-five. It says, yeah. Whereas Newcastle uh, is it about one two five? I think it says on it. Yeah, so, one twenty-five. Yeah. yeah. But as you said, price is much more different. Hence, the yields um, much more attractive than the likes of and Newcastle on it. Andrew, you've got a lot of experience from particularly the Liverpool area with student property um, on it. I mean, that those prices significantly went up, didn't they, over the years? Yes. Yeah, um, I think if, if, if you do look at that, if you look at 
maybe how the pricing has gone in, in Liverpool for that studio um, in comparison to, say, the rental value. The, the, the purchase price has gone up, but the rental value has probably stayed fairly static. So you might be looking in, in Liverpool at some of the studios now, probably 90, maybe 100K, but will still only achieve that sort of 150 a week. Whereas you can buy into Newcastle, you could buy into um, other areas at 75 and still achieve that 150 a week as we've, as we've just been talking about. So I think if you look at that rental side of it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to buy in the, in the major conurbations in the likes of Liverpool, Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, um, Sheffield, Nottingham. You can buy in some of the, um, the, the more secondary locations mm -hmm. because the facilities for outside of PBSA are not there. You know, you've got the town centre, you, you talk about Newcastle, you know, it's got everything you need. It's got a view cinema, it's got three or four supermarkets, bars, restaurants, it's got everything <laughs> the student needs, but it's not a major conurbation. It, it trades on the back of the universities that they're affiliated with, the likes of Keele and, and Stafford Uni, very much so. Yeah, well, I think, so, I think one of the big things here about where to buy is that a lot of people think, you know, we'll go for a big city because we'll get growth as well. Now, the student market, student PBSA market and student accommodation market and the, the residential buy-to-let market or just the residential market are in no way connected. They're valued in different ways. So just because we're getting a huge amount or we've had a huge amount of growth in Manchester over the last sort of four or five years with buy-to-let property... It's not the case, it's not the same with student property. It hasn't increased by the same amount. And that goes back, you know, the negative we gave before, the slight negative that you're not going to get that capital growth. You should always consider that when you're thinking about where to buy. So we've always targeted or we've learned. I mean, I've been selling student property now for over 15 years. So I was pretty much at the start. And me, me and Andrew were discussing this the other day to see who was uh, who was oldest? And, <laughs> yeah, who and, that uh, one? <laughs> and, uh, Andrew shaded me, um, but um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, we we look at back at some of the developments that we saw fifteen years ago, um, and and those that have performed the best have really been in those secondary locations where you can still get a good lower price, but the rent is still relatively high, so you've got. Less competition because, uh, you know, if you walk into Liverpool as a student, you can stay in residential blocks, you can stay in, in HMOs, you can stay in guest houses, in hotels, you can stay in or, other uh, uh, student blocks. There's tons and tons of student housing options in Liverpool. You compare that to somewhere like Keele, like Loughborough, like uh, uh, Preston, there isn't the same options. So uh, always look at those secondary locations, provided the university is tra attracting enough of a demand. Um, again, always remember it's a supply demand market. Which leads nicely on to our top tips of buying PBSA. So we put together a handful here between the three of us of what we think are the most important tips when you're looking at PBSA. There are many more and we could go into it uh, well into the evening but these are the main ones that we've covered so the, the first one to look for large universities so what i mean by that is don't necessarily look at the rankings in terms of you know your oxford cambridge those sort of places they're not necessarily the best areas to buy in but more the areas where they're big universities in terms of the occupancies yeah, of it. so population. the likes of staffordshire where there's you know about fifteen thousand students on there but like john said before not the accommodation to meet the demand on it they're the sort of areas to really focus on. Or if you, you're really lucky as well, areas where there's several different universities mm. on there um, as well. Hopping back to Staffordshire, you've got Staffordshire, Keele, all within a fairly close area. Um, yeah. So a huge pool of students there that need accommodation on it. So, yeah. yeah, don't get too caught up on Russell Group University. We hear a lot, don't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they want to see the ranking table. It doesn't really matter. It's more you've got your apartment, you want it filled. The rents will be pretty similar throughout. So that's the main thing. Make sure the demand is there, which leads on to your... Yeah, onto the Russell Group, it, it's like one of the most ridiculous statements that we hear. 
mm. as sales guys or consultants, let's say. Um, I, I, I want to invest in student accommodation, but it's got to be a Russell group. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Um, He's got a lot to answer for. Yeah. <laughs> so always, look, I would look at those secondary towns, secondary cities, look for those hidden gems. Don't be buying it. I was speaking, me and Andrew again the other day were talking about the uh, um, uh, the, the the big group that are selling. Okay, do you know what are they called was Andrew? It Unite, wasn't it? Unite. Unite. Yeah. Unite. Unite, who are building tens of thousands of units in locations where a lot of the big universities are. You don't want to be piggybacking off the back of them. They're really, really cheap. Um, they, they, you know, I wouldn't say they're particularly good at management, but they, they're, they're offering really cheap accommodation. So that's something you're going to have to compete with as a landlord. You don't want that, you know. So look at look at those secondary uh, secondary areas, and don't put off, you know, if you're not that familiar with the name of the university, it might be a specialist university. Um, yeah. Ben, communal facilities, we've mentioned that before, of how important that is. And it just without repeating myself, it's because it's what students will look for. They want the gym, they want the cinema, they want everything like that. That's on their the list. So, you know, really take that into consideration when you're uh, looking at PBSA of the communal facilities themselves. Yeah, and a lot of them now are looking for car parking. Uh, they'll bring uh, either their own car or mum's and daddy's car when they get use of it, when they, when they come back. Uh, but for the sake of, you know, some of these car parking spaces are like £5,000, but they increase the rent of, of that, uh, of that uh, uh, apartment significantly, just having the option of, of being able to park your gun, because a lot of it's limited. It depends on location, though, doesn't it, on that one? We've had one um, recently in Preston, yeah. uh, Printworks, which was right on the campus. You, you don't really need parking with it. I mean, it hasn't got it anywhere, but if you did probably wouldn't recommend it but there's certain student property that we've sold where you know it's maybe five ten minute drive um from the pbsa and it, it's it's worth it isn't it they're yeah. normally about five thousand pound parking space in student property no. it, it's definitely worth it in certain locations next tip yeah 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 um, so fully enclosed studio apartments i mean again typically what we sell tends to be um self-contained that way as opposed to the cluster units we mentioned before and it probably more relates now to COVID mm. um, on that front. So students want their own kitchen, their own ensuite, have their own space. But then if they want to, they've got the communal areas, the lounge, everything like that to go to, uh, to mix with others. So very important that, and particularly with the overseas clients, we hear a lot about overseas students now really wanting their own self-contained um, studio rooms on that. I can't think of anything worse than a shared kitchen in student accommodation. Not if I was living with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd have to tell me where it was first. <laughs> so a running joke, we've got about coffees. Um, yeah, and, and finally, uh, use it in a, a look for an established management company. I mean, we use, uh, in, in Canterbury Hall, I think we've got uh, student facilities management who are very, very good. Homes for students are good as well. Uh, look for that that good operator that's going to keep you well informed. Uh, that's that's you know I always think if if they're good with you, they're going to be good with the students. Yeah. Yeah. It's not always the case. We've dealt with some that are very good with the students and not so good with the admin side. But um, a lot know. of them get the actual some of the students as well, don't they, to work in these purpose built blocks mm. as well. It's quite often ambassador, student, student ambassador student scheme. Ambassador, ambassador yeah. scheme. Yeah, yeah. So they'll get a student within there and pay them a little bit of pocket money. And they're this sort of go to person, aren't they? So if mm. students have got a problem, they'll go to them in the first instance and then they can report higher up. Really I'm good scheme, actually. Yeah, mum and absolutely. Yeah, but no, a really good scheme on that front mm. um, as well. I think Rowan's asked a question, John. Yeah. Um, what, top, what are the options, if any, trust accounts and deposits? From when I would be ready to purchase. You... Is, is, is that where we're asking um, how secure the deposits are? What's Rowan uh, based on international transfers? I think on that, Rowan, the the monies are transferred uh, through solicitors. So we don't touch the money. The developer doesn't touch the money in the initial stage. It's all done through uh, through the two solicitors, your own and the developers. With regards to an international transfer, you have a number of options to use 
um, the likes of the FedEx companies or the bank that you bank with. What I would say on the international transfer, look look around because you can get better rights by using a, a monetary company, but just ensure you're using a good one. So I think, yeah, no reason why you can't transfer monies from overseas. Is it secure? Yes, it is. If you use the right services. What a lot of solicitors are doing today, they will send the account details to you and then they will ask you to call to verify that they've given you the right details. So they sort of facilitate the lack of phishing, should we say, by actually sending it, emailing it to you, WhatsApping it to you and making a call. I know the solicitors we work with do it, do that basis that they will call you to say, just repeat to me the numbers you've got there, the account details to ensure that the money is um, safely transferred in, into their client account. But just on, just on, that answer, on, yeah. on deposits, um, really important to understand this, but when you transfer your deposit to the holding account, and that's your money lodged in the solicitor's account, some people say to me, well, what, what's stopping the developer running off with the money? Developers can't run off with the money. They don't have access to it. What they can do is they can pay the costs of the building or the costs of the project with your money. They could use your money to pay the builders, to pay the architect, to pay for marketing, but they cannot withdraw the proper, the money themselves. They have to put, uh, what they have to do what's called a, a quality certificate which is approved by the warranty company and a quantity surveyor. And only then when it's signed off, can it be used to pay uh, an, an actual invoice for something that has contributed towards the building of that development. So don't ever worry about and it, a developer running off with your money. It can actually make it more safe and kinder than a developer using a fund to build it where you can have problems <coughs> with banks, especially with what's happened with COVID and stuff. Mm. This is actually more secure because, I mean, we saw it when COVID hit. You know, ultimately, everything just freezes, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, there's not, yeah. There's not money being spent like there would be if it was funded. It just stops. And then when they restart again, they have the money, like you say, produce the invoice and works and done it and get it that way. So It yeah. also means that if something happens to the developer who's developing your uh, development, <laughs> a lot of develops in there, um, then... If something happens to them and they go bankrupt for whatever reason, because of the structure of way it, the way it works with paying the contractors, you can bring in another developer to complete that development, as long as that money's not been mismanaged in any way. And from a business point of view, I mean, the developer, let's be honest, they only make their money when it's completed. Mm -hmm. you know, all the costs are right to that point, and that's when they make the money. So it's in their interest to get it done. Um, on that front as well. So hopefully we've answered your question there, Roy, uh, well enough um, on that. So, I mean, this is an educational webinar, but um, we're obviously going to talk a little bit about the projects we have. Um, we've got one at the moment, which Andrew, hopefully you're just going to give a very quick overview and then we can, if people want more details, they can uh, uh, apply for that. Yeah, I'm conscious we're, we're sort of close to our time limit here. So just very briefly, as Mike said, it's not a sales pitch, but the Villas Stoke on Trend, Purpose-built student accommodation going to complete September 22. Purchase price, as we've been discussing, around that 75, 74, 950. 8.5% assured return for three years, um, excluding the ground rent. So effectively, you're going to be netting about 8% on that for the three-year period. As Mike made reference to, monies are deposited. You, you're, the payment plan would be 50% on exchange, 25% in March 22, and the balance on, on completion. But 4% interest is paid on that money and then deducted from the, the completion statement. So throughout the course of the build, your, your, your deposit monies will earn interest for you at 4%, and that money will be used to build it out for you. Um, so, yeah, there we are very quickly. Uh, 170 Two, I think, is it, Mike? 178? There's 170 something. <laughs> you yeah, yeah. should know. 170 something studios, true studios, self contained, kitchen, bathroom in there, common facilities, very similar and slightly above the quality that we saw of One London Road. Yeah. Um, we sold 120, we have about um, just short of 60 units and uh, studios remaining. So if you have an interest in student accommodation, Give the sales guys a call, the consultants a call, and uh, have a conversation with them. 
Absolutely, it's the same as developers Andrew we mentioned um, aboard that built the likes of One London Road that we showed you earlier on, the Van Sport Link. So, you know, feel free, like you said, booking a consultation. We're happy to meet you to show you around that uh, particular block and give you a feel for what it is, what it looks like on that front. Because it'll be very similar, if not a better finish, like Andrew says. And I, th I think you're right, Mike. If, if, if you are in the UK, yeah, you might be down in London. It's what, an hour and 10, I think, from London to Stoke train station. We'll meet you at Stoke, we'll show you one London road, we'll take you to the site of, of the villas, but you'll get a feel for exactly what you're buying into. Um, mm -hmm. You can talk to Urban Student Life who are managing it. We have a, a, a concierge there during the, certainly Monday to Friday. Come and have a look, come and, come and touch it, feel it, see what you're buying. And there's just some images as well of the villas, some CGI's of what um, it intends to look like, which hopefully it follows suit as what One London Road did, because I think the actual Finish with better than some of the CGI's on there. So. Yeah, I was, I was yeah. shocked because I went really. I, I only went to the as a construction site a few times, mm -hmm. but I remember as well when you and Andrew were stood in that video looking yeah. into the wilderness. <laughs> uh, and I remember previously it was a garage and it had it dropped down a huge level, and you just couldn't picture it at all. And I, I took a few clients uh, yeah. there at the time, but. They had the old oil drums, didn't they? That they pulled up. I think we saw Andrew did yeah. one time on it. So yeah, yeah. Got it. yeah, it looked like a lot of work, didn't it? But it's unbelievable what they, they did with it. In there. Oh, the, the end result is chalk and cheese. I, I think a lot of people who who bought that and and did the the visit with us probably couldn't imagine how good it would end up. Yeah. And, and I think a consequence. I, I think you made reference to it uh, a couple of days ago, Mike. People that we've met at London Road have gone on to buy in the villas. Impressed yeah. with the quality of the finish that we've uh, that abode have achieved that, and it's not just the, the buildings; it's the outside areas, the car parks, and the and the and the the bedding plants that they put in, and the and and the surroundings. It looks so clean. It looks so um, uh, you, you know new. A, a lot of new housing estates now they do the housing; they don't do the road until. Sort of a year afterwards. It's still not done mine. It's not done it's two yours. years later, I'm still working. Yeah. If you're watching Red Rum. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, you're right on that. Um, which aboard's very different to that, isn't it? You yeah. You look really good on the externals. Right, I'm cautious of time. We've rambled on for um, mm. a lot of that. So yeah, I mean, if anyone's got any questions or wants to speak to one of our consultants, you may get the likes of Mike Johns to speak to you on that. Um, mm. We are more than happy to speak to you on anything. You know, we. We like to understand what exactly it is you're looking for yep. at our investment, first and foremost, because it might not be student property that we recommend to you. Mm -hmm. It's important to worth pointing out on that front. But please get in touch. You Like I said, book in a consultation call. I think Jason will put the link on after this. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed it. Um, you know, And we will have a, the next webinar. I think it's going to be the end of September, isn't it, the, mm -hmm. the next one? But we'll, we'll send the link around to everyone on that as well. So, Andrew, thank you very much for joining us remotely. Not a problem. Good to be here, Mike. Good to be and here. Thanks again to Shane. If you have stayed on uh, for that, really appreciate it as well. And cheers, John, for joining us. Yeah, cheers, mate. Great Great enjoy. Enjoy. Cheers, Shane. There we are. There you go, Shane, yeah. I did stay. <laughs> I was testing you there, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> thanks a lot, guys. Cheers, all. Have cheers, a great cheers. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye for now. Bye-bye.